So let's get to the last topic here in section 10, the density of states effective mass. In, in here we're trying to uh, collapse complicated dispersions like this ellipsoid into simplified expressions such that those simplified expressions can be used for device calculations that are sort of back of the envelope or, or simplified computer models. All right, so let's start from the uh, nice material, the gallium arsenide. At the gamma point, as indicated here, it has a very close to ideal spherical density of states uh, isosurface. That means there's a single effective mass in all three directions of the crystal that uh, are governing the isosurfaces and the density of states. So we can calculate a density of states in 3D with a single effective mass for gallium arsenide, like this. Now, for the holes, as I mentioned, things are more complicated. In fact, the isosurfaces of heavy and light holes are rather complicated, and they're definitely not looking like spheres. But in most cases, people approximate these by a single effective mass, even though there's typically three different effective masses in three different crystal directions, as you can kind of point out here. Nevertheless, people talk about a single heavy hole effective mass and a single light hole effective mass that folds into the density of states. And people then uh, integrate those states over these effective values. All right, so that's gallium arsenide or materials that are at the gamma point. And again, for silicon and for germanium, we would do the same here for the valence bands as well not just gallium arsenide. All right, so now let's look at uh, germanium. Again, we had indicated the dispersion of germanium here along the, the uh, uh, lambda line and identified that there is a minimum here at uh, the L point. Again, we have equivalent L points here on multiple surfaces. There's eight of those that correspond to eight of these uh, ellipsoids. Again, half of the ellipsoid is inside the Brion zone, the other half is outside the Brion zone. And what we're going to do now is approximate this, this equi-energy surface of this ellipsoid into a single sphere that has the same amount of states in it. Okay, So it's the equivalent representation of the complicated ellipsoid. All right, here's the expression for this ellipsoid as a function of one longitudinal mass and two transverse masses, okay? So, now let's write down our requirement that the density of states and the number of, that the number of states in the system must be constant as we replace this ellipsoid with a, with a sphere. So what we do is we identify uh, coefficients alpha and beta in this um, uh, volume of constant energy and transform that into a single sphere. Now, here's the volume of an ellipsoid, given these principal axes with alpha, beta, and beta. And there we have the number of states in the system, and this is also then the number of valleys we consider. We want to set that, including the, the number of uh, states, into an effective K on a perfect sphere. Okay, So we can do that by entering these coefficients. Here we have again four-thirds, and here is the alpha, here is the beta, is the beta, and we have a power of 3, so we take the third, third root here, and what you get is that you can express an effective density of stays mass as a function of root of 2 thirds with ml star. So you take the, uh, the third root of the product, or the geometric product of ml times mt squared. 
So that's one way of counting the same amount of states at the isosurface as we have done uh, before, but all the states are transformed into a sphere. So for the germanium, we have four of these half uh, uh, ellipsoids. So that's the number four here. For germanium, we have six of those because all six are inside the Brion zone. So these are the transformations to get from the ellipsoid masses of the longitud uh, longitudinal and transverse masses or the heavy electron mass and the light electron mass into a single density of states affect the mass, which allows us to carry forward analytical calculations easier. All right. So that really concludes section 10, where we looked at properties of real materials. So the EK diagrams are uh, solutions to Schrodinger equation. Um, they are uh, calculated on, in a reciprocal space, and a reciprocal space represents very nicely uh, symmetries of the crystal. So you will look into certain crystal directions to find uh, interesting properties uh, that vary in particular crystal directions. Um, these EK diagrams indicate uh, where states electrons can be. We haven't talked much about the occupation of those states. And uh, I did spend a lot of time trying to elucidate that these EK diagrams really are reflective of the underlying crystal symmetry. We have a feeling that only a few of these uh, states are occupied. And as we calculate the occupancy of these states, it's very useful to consider a property called density of states. That allows us, in a differential sense, say, if I add a sliver of energy, how many states will I occupy? So I can um, um, calculate the number of occupied states given certain distribution functions in temperature. And this is very, very useful to carry through. And later you will be able to look at a density of states and say, aha, I understand what that kind of material is or what this kind of band does. So those are important things to understand and appreciate. So with that, uh, this is ending section 10, and we can start to dive into more material properties and really into transport and into non-equilibrium. So thank you.